so you join us for the concluding part of the series. In the last episode, we left Oira anchored at North Minerva Reef, and now we rejoin the crew as they sail past South Minerva on their final passage to New Zealand. Scurrying on by Mud Pudge there, looking at it. Jess, casually steering for me. She doesn't realise I've got the string on, so she can't steer anymore than that, eh? <laughs> As the crew hand steer past South Minerva, sailing vessel Charlotte, also on her way to New Zealand, is sighted off the port bow, along with a lot of pumice. Passing through a pumice field, a couple of months ago there was a floating island of pumice and I wonder if this is what remains of it. Well, this is the biggest streak we've found yet though, isn't it? It is. Bugger, bugger in luck. Looks like someone's been to the cattery, doesn't it? Oh, it's more than a cat. Oh no, I could, I could cat this amount. So after the crew pass through the pumice slick, they receive a gift from the ocean. With a classic bowl and tail technique, the crew land the mahi mahi and fill it and prepare in the normal way. Day two at sea, Mudgee's just rescued the dairy milk chocolate with coconut pieces in it from the naughty Jessica, who's been down in the aft cabin watching a film on the old iPad, generally having a very decadent time. Out. I'm having a day. So as the cabin girl has a pyjama day, the rest of the crew set about a rather rudimentary means of communication. To the finder of this message in a bottle. This bottle was set adrift on 17th November 2012 as the great vessel Oira crossed the international date line in a gentle southeast breeze and near flat seas on passage from Tonga to New Zealand. Latitude 2, 5 degrees, 3, 0 south. Longitude 179 degree 59 west. Oh, Off it bobs. Just having a bit of chickpeas and couscous. How are you doing today, Jessie Lyon? Very well, thank you. Very well. How many movies have you watched? <laughs> you naughty little pickle, aren't you? Fudgelini's on watch. Engine bunny, is it? Engine bunny. So, with light winds, the crew take the opportunity for a much needed wash day whilst they ponder the need for the engine. Showered and now clean, it seems the wind has picked up and the captain summarises the daily report. Here is Fudgy with a daily report. <laughs> we hope we should get in by the 23rd. Right now we're making our way south as far as possible because there's a possibility of a hello forming and heading down toward New Zealand so we want to be ahead of it. At the moment we're at uh, 26 degrees south. We reckon we're safe from the low if we get beyond 30. So off we go and uh, we are doing a splendid speed of about four knots at the moment which is probably about what an average is at. 
Alas, the wind doesn't last long, and before lunch is finished, the crew turn the engine on to keep ahead of that low. There's the old mud punch at the helm. So, morning of our third day at sea. Third day? Well, third day since we the week. Third day. Have you seen it? It's Magellani's making a bit of coffee. No, I'm not making a bit of coffee. She's having hot chocolate, bloody hell. We've started off by running the engine last night, and the wind came back. And we're sailing again at about three and a half knots on a run. Yeah. We can do six when we go off course, but we do end up on a beam reach southeast. You really don't want to go around the horn. But yeah, it's just. It's we don't have the water for it, if nothing else. No. So as the crew muse over the problems of veering off course and going round Cape Horn at the tip of South America, the great vessel gently sails downwind. Mid-morning, it's time for the crew's dried fruit ration. Mmm, it's craisin ration time. A heaped tablespoon for every crew member. The happiest time of the day. Isn't that right, Jesse? So, the constant stress of being on board is starting to enter even in the crew members' dreams. What's been happening, Jess? I was just saying that I had, I had a dream last night that we nearly went aground. An island popped up in the sea and I had to quickly come the other way but everyone else was distracted and nobody realised. But it's just a sandy, pretty tropical island. Was it not the pumice? Was it because of all the no, pumice? No, pumice, the sea was clear. But I said that it wouldn't have been so bad if we'd gone aground because it was sandy. Oh dear. We could have had a quick snorkel. <laughs> Instead of snorkeling, the pastimes have become bracelet making, haven't they? Yes, and this is the little number that was produced in the last 12 hours. Ah, beauty. Jess is starting a new one there. I am indeed. And I've begun a little something over here. 27 degrees south, 178 east, on our route to New Zealand. And the crew sit down to a very leisurely lunch. There's never been such high quality table manners at sea on Oira before, has there, guys? <laughs> what are you doing there, Jess? Just getting our cabin nice and cosy for us. Bit and what? De-pumping. De-pumping, eh? So while Jess fights a constant battle with the pumpies, the cabin boy checks in via the SSB. Speed 4.5. We have a wind of 12 knots at the northeast and half a metre swell from the northeast. How copy? Well, I copy a course of 240 degrees. Golden glossary today, isn't it? You see people are locked in the cabin where they should be. Of course, I'm on watch with my single staysail doing about five knots. Watch that. Thank you. Is it your first date? It's my first date, yeah. Kile fa e segenke, kile balo segenko no. Kile kera fenye biye, kile bana mogora, kile dona yadaro, yada duni mogoti ana, yada juu duni mogoti ana. Yada mani ne, yada mani. Extend that far. So we've been racing there, we're now at 29 degrees. I 
haven't heard anything more about this possible problem. Good morning. Yeah, so I'm on watch and um, I, we're just having the typical, you know, um, midday meal consultation. Whether we're going to use tablecloth, um, bridge following it, whether we crack a bottle of wine or the final can of beer. Or the, the only final can of beer. Why don't yeah. we make beer battered but fingers? But in view of the situation I, that my second lieutenant is just putting on his wet weather gear, thinking of popping up a bit of mane. Double reefed mane. Really? No way full mane. Not the spinnaker though. Pull it in as much as you can. If you can, it should be able to go further. So after a rather lively foredeck manoeuvre to set a preventer rope, which stops the newly hoisted mane flapping back and forth as the boat rolls, it's now time to dry off the wet clothes of the night. Nice, sunny. And you can see evidence that it was a rather wet night behind us. Proved by all the <laughs> drying clothes on this Chinese laundry ship. And we've got light winds again, so we're moving about three knots after our cracking night sail. But we're forecast to have southeast winds. I'm not sure what strength they're supposed to be, actually. I didn't listen to that part. But anyway, at least we're going to be able to do a beam reach for that, so we should be able to do nice things and stop this incessant rolling of downwind sailing, which I really do not enjoy. On the 21st of November, a Wednesday, about 350 miles away from Apua, at 30 degrees south. 350 miles too far. <laughs> Kelly is 10 minutes late for the watch. He's just... I've only just been woken up. He's a little pickle. He's a bit frosty this morning. He's a bit of a sleepy bear. And where is the aft cabin? This is a little section. A bit feral. She's coming off. Face is feral. Wakey, wakey. Looking flat <laughs> in her fur. <laughs> she reminds me of Dobby. <laughs> After the cabin boy's late started watch, the navigation officer takes over, by which time the wind has died and the engine has to go on. It doesn't stop the crew enjoying their audiobooks. Magellini at the helm, Potter. enjoying a bit of Harry Potter, making very slow progress even with the engine on. And in this calm setting, it seems the crew align themselves with the characters from their audiobooks. Aunt Petunia has made a cake. Dudley said loudly that Harry Potter shouldn't be allowed any. Uncle Vernon, in an unusual case of gluttony, gluttony <laughs> ate <laughs> all his cake and gave a small scrap to Harry, <laughs> who munched it hungrily, thanking his lucky stars and hoping Dudley wouldn't have seen. But Dudley had seen. Give that back, said Dudley, and took the cake from him. 22nd yeah, of November. And day two, I'd say, of incessant rain and wetness. We're being cooked up a lovely breakfast by the mother. Okay, we'll leave the Warned up there. beef -ness. And if you look outside, you'll see how wet things really are. Poor Fagellini sitting there in two raincoats and a waterproof trousers. Dripping. Dripping. <laughs> and it's not heavy oh, rain, it's just it's continuous and incessant. I get onto myself. Yeah. Seems a bit rude. And the boat has become rather feral, but that hasn't stopped this little pair of pixies munching into corned beef. A lone spring onion in the fresh fruit hammock. These are the voyages of the great vessel Oira, a continuing mission to seek out strange new squalls, to get wet, to boldly go where many ships have gone before in much faster times. And yet here we are, 240 miles out of Apur, waiting on the fish which has still yet to bite our lines, or at least stay on after it's bitten. Cooking sugar into our tomato pasta sauces as we scrump along to gravishing 3.5 knots, not having the balls to take out the reef in the main because we just can't be arsed. 
Yes, that's the Oira way. Nonetheless, eventually we did decide to shake out that reef and we've picked up at least 0.2 of a knot, I'd say. Yes. Pasta's still cooking. Still waiting on the incessant SSB, which rules our life and our battery supplies. Mmm, very nice. Give me the camera. And what do you think it needs? Go ahead and call. Pasta. Here is Kelly. What are you doing, Cal? Well, you join us at a very rare time on the trip. Dudley. Dudley's been forced to do a chore, has he? I've been forced to do a chore. Dudley, eating all that dinner, had more and more and more. Jenny's getting Full. quite into Harry Once Potter. Again. Now we've got a little chain of drying and washing here between Jenny and Kelly. See, the black bucket was the pea bucket, that's for washing in the first instance. Then you rinse it in the green bucket, which was the poo bucket. <laughs> then you pass it down to Mugiolini who dries it. So after the washing up, the crew find out how feral the boat has become, and the cabin boy lets us in on his secret to dry clothes. And here's Cal, um, I think putting his PJs on, oh no, getting his um, extra Socks warm arctic being shared gear. between three crew members. Three! You, me and Fudge. I'm not wearing them anymore. I've gone back to my pad that I've been wearing for 10 days. But just know in my, my boots, surely you're time. wearing the clean socks I gave you. <laughs> just Things as have got rather feral, though, to be honest. You should see the cattery. That's not true about the cattery, Cal, because I cleaned it. Even though somebody that had been sort of... OK, let's not, let's not go into what was wrong with the cattery. Cal, how much more wet stuff? These have to be folded up, rolled over, and then what I've got left on is my dry layer. So, so I fold up and put in the chart table. I don't know. <laughs> but Cal, so for, for going to the cinema, what what do you wear at the cinema? No, no, seriously, check this out. This is a really good tip for anyone. No, no, I've seen it, Cal. I've seen your gear underneath there. But what you no, don't no, know no, is no, occasionally it goes in the chart table. <laughs> Cali, it doesn't. Drys place and boot. You're not filming. Filming. Oh, Kelly, I'm just so shocked. It's going in the chart table. No one knows. Look at no, it. I'm totally in dry the sealed. Throw a bit of rice in there with it, and it can actually dry in there. I call it my drying room. I'm going to put a pair of boxes in there tomorrow night. So, with nice dry layers, the crew catch the first tuna of the trip. What's this? Oh, his dinner's been served a little bit late. I think tuna steaks. I mean, this, this is a big tuna. This is one of the bigger tunas that we've had. Thank you very much for contacting us. We're out. We just got flew over by an enormous bloody New Zealand Air Force plane. What were they doing? They're checking. We're not criminals. <laughs> that was quite exciting. It was unbelievably exciting. It was this massive yeah. plane that just Where flew it? over. So having been spotted by New Zealand Air Force, the Oira sails on to her destination. And so the crew of the great vessel draw close to New Zealand. As you can see, it certainly feels less tropical now than it did when we set off on this final leg of the trip. And the elephants have in common. Purple except for the elephant. Yes. It's just, it's 
don't have anything in common. Oh, right! Oh, right! <laughs> We're having jokes on Oira on the final eve of the trip. What did the Greek do when the elephant stood on it? It gave a little wine! <laughs> And we're enjoying the fruit section of the joke book because of course we're all in love with the idea of more fruit. A raspberry. A strawberry shape. And here we are, sunset drinks on the on the um, eve before we reach Apua. Anyone got any comments for the documentary? We've noticed the watercolour has changed and it's, been, it's gone slightly greener. It's lost its deep, deep blue. And then we checked and we're kind of off, well, we're on the continental shelf rather than off it. So with growing evidence of nearing landfall, the crew set up for their final night at sea. For Jess, this involves hunting out and curing noises. <laughs> da -da, da -da. It's the nightly noise hunt. <laughs> and tonight, what have you identified as the noisemaker? No, this has been the noise for a long, a, a long time now, a few nights. Last night I spent many hours leaning over the edge of the boat trying to... <laughs> With your little oil bottle? <laughs> the mainsail. Because <laughs> it's up here. Oh, it's up there. A clue is attaching to the boom. There is a squeaky, squeaky squeak. Listen, and what's your suggested solution, Jess? We're going to have to loosen up the clue. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to have to it's the just mainsail, here. Flapping squeaky, around squeaky. Unattached. Squeaky, on squeaky. Now I have been using plenty of this little substance. There's nothing can seem to stop the evil racket that is coming from this thing. <laughs> and look how closely we have to sleep to it. <laughs> bird. Must be near land. Oh, yeah, a bird. Wow. Beautiful. And on the morning of the ninth day, the crew awakened to a beautiful sight. A faint shadow in the horizon, surrounded by a long white cloud. Which means? Land of the Long White Cloud, Cal. And here you can see these Long White Clouds, and you can see why they named it the Land of the Long White Cloud. So with emotions high as the great vessel enters her final destination, we catch up with the crew for some interviews. So, Mugellini, how does it feel for us after eight years intermittently sailing on Oira to finally arrive at our destination? It's funny, I wouldn't have thought that it was, that it would be such an emotional moment. I'd just thought, oh yes, another bloody island. But it looks so completely different from all the islands we've been in for so long, doesn't it? There's no farms and it's not tropical, it's, it's sort of like a temperate climate. It's, it looks like England. It really does feel as though we voyaged a long yeah, way. And what's the uh, most exciting thing about coming to land today for you? The most exciting thing? What piece of food, let's <laughs> say it, because we are talking to Mugellini here, what piece of food have you uh, have you food. most missed? What piece of food are you most looking forward to? Cold sauve blanc. Cold, cold sauve blanc. Yeah, cold, cold chardonnay, cold chablis, some sort of cold white wine. A bit of yeah. a winery, right? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to do a bit of vineyard visiting, really. <laughs> How do you feel to be coming into New Zealand today? It feels good. I think we're all tired and it's a crazy thought to think. I don't know, I don't think it's really sunk into any of us that we're finally arriving at this magical destination. I mean, look at it. It's crazy. What a, what a magical looking island. and so different to everything that we've seen over the last few months. <laughs> Could you give us some insight into 
one particular thing that I know our viewers will be interested about, which is catting on board and how you're looking forward or not looking forward perhaps to, to catting on, um, on a stationary cattery. No, I'm quite excited about the showers particularly. It'll be nice to possibly walk into a, a bathroom a little bit less feral than perhaps what we've been experiencing over the last few weeks. Um, and I'm really looking forward to my cheese platter, which is my item of choice from the um, supermarket when we do get there. Um, yeah, that's... You use the term feral. Has, has that been something you've noted somewhat on the boat? A bit of feralness? What, what do you think has contributed mainly to this feralness? I can't really say. I mean, the cattery is pretty feral. The have... surfaces are pretty grubby. The aft cabin is like a hamster den. So as the crew reflect on the feral times they spent aboard the great vessel, she enters the Bay of Islands. Now in safer waters, it's time for the navigation officer to check into the SSB radio net for a final time. Uh, go ahead with your report. We have arrived in Opua after days and days of being at sea. I think it's 14 days um, we are finally here. Mind you, we did have a short stopover in Minerva Reef. Oh, well done. Congratulations and uh, have a, an enjoyable stay uh, while you're with us. Uh, thank you very much and a huge thank you to the NET who's provided so much support, not just for us but for our families who've been able to follow our position, our steady progress as we have no, no other communication on board. So thank you again. You're most welcome and uh, we'll look for you again uh, when you put the thing. Thanks very much. All you're on the side. Uh, Moira. Woohoo! Yeah! Captain John putting up the yellow flag, which happens to be one of Sam's infamous snorkel t-shirts. Dropping the sails after 10 days at sea. And with the sails down, we catch up with the captain. So, Fudge, you sit here reflecting on the eight year voyage? Yes, I do. I do a bit, yes. Does it feel a bit like we've returned to England? Well, it certainly looks very um, civilised. What? The, the countryside is more dramatic than anything you see in England. It does, doesn't it? Fudgy, what over the last eight years do you feel has been the hardest time on board Oira? The most challenging? The storm in Portugal, I think. It's funny, so soon after our, on actually on our first leg, first big leg of the trip. Yes. What, what made that so, what made that the hardest time? It was life threatening. What force winds do you think it was? Maybe force 10. I don't really know. Big, big seas? Very big. Big fish? I didn't see any big fish. Broke the bowsprit? I don't think there's a fish that did that. What are you most looking forward to eating, Fudgy, now you'll be getting to dry land? What's your biggest craving been on this last 10 days? I think I'd like a nice steak and chips. So with those final thoughts from the captain, the great vessel makes her way past Russell and comes alongside the quarantine docker to Pur, where there's great excitement from the crew who will need to spend a final night on board here before being able to clear immigration and customs in the morning. Seconds after Callie has turned the engine off, I'm just doing a filming as we arrive. I've arrived. <laughs> Tied up. 
Well, I mean, Four and a half lines, we need our springs on. Yay! I think Fudgy take control. Fudgy! So, what are you suggesting? We should be dressed in a red and white gingham dress and army boots. And. Because we're on the quarantine dock, Fudge? Despite the arrival excitement, the cabin boy's red dwarf references fail to amuse the captain, who sets about securing his vessel. There we go, contact! Oh, you're coming back to us again, boys. Oh, Ashby's the world, isn't it? Okay, so We've arrived! <laughs> Yay! I'm going to have away! <laughs> Off to have the beer on arrival. And the arrival night dinner, the beer on arrival, one can shared between four. Oh, 14 children aboard. Really? Yeah, you don't. And us discussing <laughs> our new life. I know it's the start of a new adventure, but it's been... Yeah, I mean, and we're all... John's like, I'm delighted. <laughs> no, I mean, we're, we're all pleased that, you know, we're going to have a little bit more space around us and nobody's going to be quite as grumpy as they what? were recently. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. This was the final episode in the Great Vessel's passage from England to New Zealand, which spanned nearly eight years.